Kelly, it is my pleasure to welcome Beth Kephart back to the author event series. Kephart is the author of more than 30 books across a wide range of genres, including poetry, young adult fiction, and most notably, the memoir. These works include the award-winning how-to guide, Handling the Truth, and Love, an ode to all things Philly. A writing professor at the University of Pennsylvania and the co-founder of Junction Workshops, she is the recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Grant, a Pew Fellowship, and the Speakeasy Poetry Prize, among other honors. Kephart's new illustrated memoir, My Life in Paper, was born from the aftermath of her father's passing and explores how various forms of paper tie to our memories, legacies, and inner archives. We are honored to have Kephart with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming her to the stage. It is always so nice to be here, and thank you so much. Do you know that was her first introduction? She's kind of new to the job, so very cool. Um, I'm going to read about the book, and then I'm going to read from the book, and I'm really grateful all of you are here. It is, I know, very cold out there, and it is also very hard to get here in, when, it, when, when you're trying to go down the Schuylkill, which my husband bravely navigated that for us. So My Life in Paper is a book about paper, how it shapes and holds and records our lives. And it's about how paper ephemera, those letters, diaries, wills, report cards, resumes, deeds, menus, paper games, I'm sure you can list paper ephemera from your own life that has mattered, carry our small triumphs and large shames and ordinary disappointments forward. Structurally and tonally, the book is a memoir and essays with a twist. That twist is a series of letters I write to Dart Hunter, the late, great paper adventurer who I bet you've never heard of, who sought to understand and revive handmade paper at a time when commercial paper mills made the stuff fast and cheap with great harm to the environment. It's not that I believe that ephemera, those things that are meant to exist for just a short period of time, tell the complete story of us. It's that I believe that paper can both dislocate long prejudice and shift the landscape of our seeing. It's that I believe that paper, as fragile as it is, how increasingly unpopular binds us. My father's notes on an index card are not your father's notes on the back of an envelope. Your mother cutting into an old sewing pattern is not my mother setting out paper lanterns on Christmas Eve. My uncle's paper bag of tricks did not belong to your favorite aunt, and your family's book of songs is not my family's book of songs. But these old, fading, tattered, endangered bits of the past yield among us common and palpable feelings that nudge against our hearts, that quickness in our pulse, that melancholy yielding to hours lost imperfectly resurrecting ourselves, imperfectly resurrecting ourselves. My Life in Paper borrows its title from that Dart Hunter whom I mentioned a few moments ago. His autobiography, published in the mid-20th century, was called after a very long battle with Alfred Knopf himself, My Life with Paper. His book came to me as a gift, as I'm about to read, and I was immediately drawn in by Dart, who told extraordinary stories about traveling the country with his brother as part of a magic show about meeting an ancient turtle, about trying desperately and not really finally succeeding to build a handmade paper mill, about answering an invitation to sit with Gandhi. Dard was one of those writers who made room for the reader, and I was right there with him as I read, learning the history of paper, learning the stories of paper, makings, paper makers, learning what paper is and means. I began to read Dard at a particularly vulnerable time in my own life. I was failing, I felt, at teaching. I was losing, I felt, my ability to make sense of story. I was unmoored, I knew, my father having passed away a few years before. I was anxious about this thing I do, writing books, publishing them, for I wasn't sure, and I'm still not sure, are we ever sure, if there's still room for us in this literary world. In reading Dard, I began to think in fundamentally new ways about the big issues in life, home, possession, failure, obsession, the things we leave behind. 
I wanted to talk to Dart about this big life stuff, and so I began to write him letters to imagine him alive. I have pursued throughout my writing and teaching life the idea of the universal, how to take a story that is so particular and to move it into a realm that belongs to any reader who has time and interest. I want my work, no matter how personal it is, to reawaken memories for others, to raise questions, to engage the curious or satisfy the unsettled. It all lives for me in the art of juxtaposition private and particular things rubbed up against the intimately shared. And so in my life, you will also find with nearly every personal story I tell, a story of something bigger, a story about the beginning of the photograph, say, or cyanotype, or a contemplation of the obituary, or a little touch of Leonardo da Vinci in the history of the resume. I'm honored to be here tonight. I thank Andy and Laura and all of you, and of course, Sean Vigil and Gary Kramer and Temple University Press, and my husband, who didn't just drive me here tonight, but drove me to Chillicothe, Ohio, to meet Dart Hunter III and to stand inside Dart Hunter's home. And then again, he got behind the wheel and drove us to Atlanta to go visit the museum of Dart Hunter's paper things. Whoa, there is a lip here. I have to remember not to fall down it. So what do I mean about writing letters to Dart Hunter? I'm going to read the first true letter in the book, part of it, and then I'm going to read some other pieces from the book, pieces that are personal, pieces that I hope will give you a sense for what this book is about, but pieces that also, I hope, will have you thinking about your own lives. That is the point. Dear Dart, only because my mother ordered you from across state lines and you were sent whispering to her home wearing your jacket, crisp and white, your title, My Life with Paper. Only because she buried you among her sacred things. Only because you came to me as a brother's resurrection and not as a gift she gave, not as a gift she would have intended to give the daughter from whom she kept the sacred safe, those things she loved the ways. Not a single page of you bent, no crease at any corner, not a pencil quipping marginalia scoring a line splattering an asterisk, not a loosening in the binding where she might have pressed her right hand, keeping her place on the page, for she was left-handed, her dark alphabet leaning and looped. If she took notes why she read you, if she read you, if you were there with her at the end when she lay in the glass box of the room where she died on the bed we had rented for her dying, where she remembered in the order of her remembering something moving beneath the lids of her eyes, maybe a hope she'd had to write you into the book she never finally wrote, maybe the sound in her ear of your best sentence, did she, am I fabricating, exaggerating, demanding, dard, hunter, paper, hunter, hers, proof of her private interior world I never will now open, late December sun soft on her eternally beautiful face, orchards on the sill, a Bible, a gallery of family faces framed, and the blue morphine and the inscrutable haze, holding her hand, crushing our distance there at the end when our only words were song and I was the one singing. I designed her funeral her memorial, her place on the hill beneath the Caroline chimes, her red granite stone, the distribution of her belongings. I mean to say that I did with my father. After she was gone, I chased her, chased the winter fox, the yellow bird, the stories that her best friend told, and then I stopped running and she vanished over the hill and gone. A woman, it seemed, I had never known, a story I stopped seeking. Then my brother gave her copy of your book to me. I thought you should have it. And to you, as some kind of oracle, I turned. Now there are spits of snow, a cracked cold. Now there is a teaching day in my city. Two hours from now, I will join a dozen young writers in an acoustically challenged room, the ancient windows open to the ventilating weather, our faces slick beneath our masks, our stifled voices boomeranged by hidden microphones. And I will say, quoting Victoria Chang, who was quoting another, shorter, 
shorter, denser, denser, louder, louder, and I will ask what silence is so that we might conduct our filibuster, and I will quote Chang again, this time directly, writing is not a choice but an act of patience, an act of listening to silence into silence. But now in this hour darred in the Van Pelt Library on the University of Pennsylvania campus, among millions of stacked and ordered volumes, along miles of metal shelves, behind walls that slide open, swallow whole, I've been searching for you, and I've come up empty. If I want to hold the other books you wrote, Paper Making in Pioneer America, Paper Making the History and Technique of an Ancient Craft, I'll have to make a reservation in the Kislak Rare Book Room, leave my belongings in a locker, sit among the hermetically sealed, wait for a librarian to retrieve each volume and to place it before me like a sacrifice on a pillow so that I might turn your pages with a gloved hand delicately. I'd rather stand. I'd rather walk. I'd rather drive north to east Aurora, New York, where you learned your early trades, or west to Mountain House in Chillicothe, Ohio, where you letterpressed some of those books you wrote on the paper you made with the type you designed, having the paper that you found inside your travels bound in by your bookbinder, or south to Atlanta, where your 100,000 paper artifacts, molds, decals, watermarks, vats, racks are museum protected, and this is him. As I look back over the years, my only feeling is that my life has been wasted. In the present world, the only things that count are rush and speed and a desire to get to the moon. My work has been totally unspectacular. If I have done anything worthwhile, it is in the establishment of the Papal Museum. Your words dard in a letter you wrote. At a table by a sliver of window I sit. It is COVID sparse and my KN95 has cupped a hot cloud to my nose, my lips, my chin. I am a born hyperventilator. I breathe uneasily. Outside noon, a chime descended of here comes the sun rifts off a carillon hidden in the alumni house just down the walk because there is no bell tower on this campus, just a small box of sound maintained by a donor's contribution in memory of a daughter. By which I mean that everything now is a little less true than it was when you were living. Or perhaps I mean that the manner and means of our authenticity have changed the ways we hold and keep us. And your life, Dard, your life was hardly wasted. Shorter, shorter, denser, denser. I close my eyes, I listen. I remember the story you, I read and the story you wrote in the book my brother gave me. I was turning your pages, the neat, swift, and crisp of paper. It's your best story, Dard, my favorite. It's the 20th century becoming. It's you and your brother Phil setting out to give America some magic. Phil's the actual prestidigitator. He's 20, calls himself the wizard. He has taught himself hundreds of now you see and now you don't tricks, and he's famous for them, an elegant mind teaser. For 300 a week, sometimes 1,000, he's been booked by lecture bureaus for jaw-dropped crowds in towns across the country. By passenger train, freight train, stagecoaches, you travel together, swerving across Ohio, Pennsylvania, Nebraska, the Dakotas, Florida, Kentucky, Virginia, so that you might perform. And you, two years his junior, but larger in size and so much stronger, might serve as his assistant, a job you assure readers is no sinecure. What you do, Dard, is hoist, pack, scrub, file, rinse, place into their proper sequence the hundreds of tools of your brother's trade. What you do engages 20 trucks and several packing cases and the crates and the cages and the buckets and the pails in which live your unpaid sidekicks, rabbits, you say, ducks, doves, goldfish. You care for them all, dard. You keep the whole miracle of magic untarnished and alive, show to show, town to town, squawk to squawk, don't smash the glass, don't crack the mirror, don't kill the fish, don't let the doves fly through the wombs open windows toward the heat of day, except that once, in an astonishment of awfulness, a pair of doves do, two diamond rings tied to the necks while the audience watches in horror. The wizard isn't well, but you keep going. The wizard who is the smart one in the family, the one who could excel at college, if only your parents could convince him to go, he wants more than anything to keep going. 
You want what the wizard wants. You stack his tricks in their order. You keep him company in those empty train stations, 3 a.m., half asleep, ears tuned to the incoming freighter, and there again in the ruckus of a leather-hung coach, you bounce beside him, hold on, fight against the forces that would catapult you from your seat. You are learning wanderlust. You are all extra hands, the single pair of legs that races to the local repair shop mid-show. When the wizard makes a watch, he is borrowed from the audience, a terrible accident that cannot be revealed. You become the chalk talker, a young man with sticks of color and a broad, and a board and yarns to spin while the wizard, growing more tired and more tired, catches his breath backstage. You are living the wizard's dream because time is running short for him, because you'll never have another brother, because tuberculosis has come for him, and he will have to cut his touring short, and he will die despite careful convalescence at the age of 27 in 1908. He will leave you. We had been closely associated, and I had long depended upon him for guidance, you write in the book my brother gave me, telling then of how the wizard, a student of spiritualism, hoped desperately to find a way for the dead to communicate with the living, or at least for these two brothers, best friends, to ne never lose the sound of each other. And then, in a story that I'll skip a little bit, it doesn't work. Dard spends a lot of his time trying to speak to his brother through the ether. It doesn't work. You mastered wood and color and clay and shine and the swifts and angles of each alphabetic letter before you became obsessed with paper. And then, Dard, you saved your brother on the page, made sure he did not dodge the frame, if I have done anything spectacular. I'll stop in the middle of that letter to Dard, but it, that particular letter goes on to discuss the two young women who died in Dard's arms early on. And this book of Dard's, you know, he was, a, he was a traveler, he was a big man, he wasn't trying to be literary, but for some reason, it just felt so alive to me. His sadness over loss, his desire to make beautiful things, the frustration of making beautiful things and not finding the audience for the beautiful things, all of it. And so I carry him through the book. But there are all these elements of ephemera that are here as well. And I'm going to read just a few passages now that are the sort of intimate memoiristic bits. I'm going to have some water. And the first one is my mother, for my mother. I had a difficult relationship with a very beautiful mother. Um, she could do so much, so well, but what she wanted to do in the end was be a writer. And it felt to her in a way I think that I had stolen that from her. And it became a, a complexity in our relationship. As I started to think about my life and her in my life, this is what happens when you write, when you look back, when you hold the old sewing pattern in your hand, which I'm going to read about now. You get to occupy the world from your mother, in this case, from her perspective. And to do that, I had to write this particular piece in um, third person. Sewing pattern. She has to take the measure of her daughter, the first one, the one with the coarse, dark hair and the face that comes directly from her husband, the girl's father, except for the nose. The daughter has been spared the hook and the beak of her husband's nose. A son might have carried that nose, but please, not a daughter. Still spared the nose, the daughter has her deficits. More than anything, her acrid awareness of her many deficits. This knowing curved into the slump of her shoulder blades and into the stiff-legged way she, that she walks right up to the edge of things where she will stop no faith at all in her own physicality or charm, in her ability to expand a room by others' happiness to see her, except for when she is on the ice, when she is ice skating. First on a Boston pond, the daughter skated, then on a rink in Wilmington, Delaware, now at the Philadelphia Humane Society in Ardmore, PA, because the family has a new house now, a brand new neighborhood. There, the daughter has acquired speed and a gritty, mystifying flair, a long, leaping axle, double loops, double flips, and double lutzes, no double wallies ever. 
She has the high speed chase of the crossovers that accelerate toward the ecstatic flights across the ice, the dizzying spin, spins, but never a successful layback, a crescendo diagonal slice of a Nina Bauer, the repertoire of footwork which the daughter pretends to improvise, but it is always the same coalescence of mohawks, three turns, brackets, arms up and hands graceful as a dainty woman dropping a dainty napkin. The daughter is never actually dainty, only her hands are dainty and only when she is on the ice skating. All this the mother sees in the afternoons when she leaves the bright new home where she's been working and arrives to retrieve, retrieve her daughter from the rink. Her daughter's program music playing over the rink's loudspeakers. Her daughter's arch rival throwing her own double lutzes in her own chosen corners, and precisely when the daughter is towing in and throwing hers. The mother stands in the numbing cold in her low-heeled shoes, her almost opaque nylons, her plaid wool skirt, and her heavy coat. Stands there watching at the metal barrier, not the fanciest of mothers, but as the prettiest one. Dark hair, big eyes, pond skin, fine nose. Stands there as a woman who left her business at home, a woman who sews, a woman perpetually taking measure of her stubbornly self-crucifying daughter, back waist length, bust line, hip point, inseam, waistline, mood. At home in the alley of her sewing room, there's a singer ensconced along the far short wall, pale yellow cabinets along the one long wall, a deep sealed window along the other wall. The mother's latest pattern waits, a butterick this time. The 5940 young junior teen cheerleader majorette in skating dress costume purchased after some deliber deliberation for 85 cents at the local fabric and notion store. It's a fitted micro mini dress with three collar variations and princess seaming. Has flared skirt with or without contrast godets. Barrel cuffed full, full length sleeves or semi fitted full length sleeves with or without braid and button trim on shoulders, sleeves, and dress front, according to the package. The slightly beige tissue paper pattern has 15 pieces. It is a kind of map, a topography defined by fold lines and easing lines, darts and dots, squares and triangles, adjustment lines, seam allowances, notches. Days earlier, standing beneath the flicker buzz of fluorescent lights in the narrow aisles of the store, among bolts of color, yards of thread, temptations of trim, zippers and rickrack, butterick, simplicity, McCall, the mother had made her choices and then brought her purchases home, imagining the daughter out on the ice wearing the costume she will make with her own time, with her own surrender to a certain kind of love. She's a good seamstress, this mother, boastlessly artful with skilled hands that slip the pattern from its package and lay it flat and with silver scissors snip. There will be globe-tipped pins in her teeth when she secures the fabric to the pattern, an iron hissing steam, the acid-free crinkle of that 85-cent pattern. There will be her history as a mother who has dressed both her daughters in clothes of her own making for almost as long as she has been a mother her room of her room, room is a room for their own. Then I list some of the things that she made us. If only there were a different first daughter, one who did not shrink from life and what life might be, but for there at the rink on the ice where she is, where she imagines herself as a someday champion transformed into the likes of Janet Lynn, who should, the daughter thinks, have won every single medal in every single competition that she entered. Janet Lynn, who was once seen skating to Beethoven while wearing a sleek pink costume made by a professional tailor. This is what the daughter wants, what the daughter believes will finally transform her, a skating costume made not by a mother and a butterick, but by a professional tailor by other hands and other eyes that will take her measure. The daughter will not say the words out loud. Instead, she'll sulk in silence. But the mother knows, and her own mood and measure will darken, as in days to come, she will smooth and cut that pattern, pins between her teeth, the iron hissing. In going back and thinking about all the things that my mother did for all of us, and the way she, 
showed her love and the ways that I refused to receive her love, um, I was, it, it was a resurrection of a kind of the mother that I never gave enough credence to when she was alive. Following this, but I'm not going to read it, is the story of the woman who was in Philadelphia who created the first true sewing patterns. It's a really interesting story about a woman named Madame Demarest, and she and her husband had the first viewing of these uh, sewing patterns not far from here. They went to New York. They became quite famous. They started these um, magazines like the Madame, Madame Demarest Mirror of Fashions, where they would um, showcase the fashions and clip in a, a, you know, a cheap pattern for women to use. And they were very socially advanced. Their stores were staffed by really interesting people. But they didn't win the race to become the most famous pattern makers because they never patented their patterns. And so um, Butterick and others took that. There's all that kind of history here inside this book. I'm going to read now just a short piece about sheet music. I wonder if any of you have at home artifacts like that. Take the sacred as Christmas Eve, my brother standing tall and dirty blonde and thin behind my seated Auburn father, my brother playing his oboe, my father his piano, good King Wenceslas and the snow lay round, certain poor shepherds in the deep, a little town where dark streets shine at the dine, divine high sea sharp. Lower the lights to a dim, let my brother nod, let him breathe, his oboe reed will sweeten. Let my father run his fingers up and down the Steinway keys, his right hand rising quick to flick the music forward. His left hand, with his gold wedding band, kept faithful to its octave. Nothing lost wholly gained my father and my brother. They play staff and clefts, treble and bass, notes stemmed and flagged, hold, halved, quartered, dotted, tied. My brother growing thinner, my father's foot working the softening, sustaining pedals, and again my brother breathes, and my father lifts his hand, flick. The air is salty with the afterfry of smelts, the tree is heavy with adornment, the stockings are hung by the chimney with care, there is a father and a son and their sheet music, there are two sisters and a mother. Keep the memory whole, uncomplicated, don't leave this home for any other. And in this footnote or note, Sean and I kind of went back and forth over what this, they would be named, these pieces of the book. I talk about the first musical arrangement scored expressly for the United States. It happened here. Um, it was uh, the imagination of, among other things, the tutor of George Washington's step-granddaughter. And it was a massive, um, a massive ordeal and a parade that involved almost everybody in Philadelphia went up and down the streets. I'm going to just read you one, one piece of that um, parade when this grand affair, this music, was um, delivered. At 8 a.m. on the morning of July 4th, 1788, the grand affair began to take its one and a half mile long shape at the intersection of Philadelphia South and Third Streets. There, in predetermined stratifications, all variety of spectaculars assembled, merchants and traders, farmers and makers, sign painters, bricklayers, coach painters, spinning wheel makers, blacksmiths and whitesmiths, skinners and glovers, printers, bookbinders, stationers, whip and cane makers, tailors, instrument makers, bearing feathery plumes and the artifacts of their manifold crafts, the assembled citizens of the brand new country lifted their knees and processed, taking their north, south, and east, west with the, in the orchestral hold of the Federal March. I love finding these things. I love imagining Philadelphia then um, and, and to think of every craft, every trade following this song. And the idea of the shoot, that was really the first sheet music here in Philadelphia, the original first sheet music written here. We all have, you know, 
this has diaries, it has report cards, it has resumes. But I think the ephemera that we all think about, all move towards um, in our hearts, maybe, are the letters. And um, I'm going to read two. Uh, one written to my son, our son, Bill and my son, and one written to my father. Dear Jeremy, you would cultivate all the merry colors if you could, raspberry, banana, mango, sky blue too, and lime. Your father favors charcoal, green if it's closer to gray, any variety of dark that he can wash and wear without worrying the iron, not you. Bring the chroma on. Slip your arms through it, your neck, and which is brighter then, your eyes or your skin or your polo? Who taught you to buy Ralph Lauren at the discount mall? Who taught you that raised eyebrow? Who taught you how to buy the smaller size so that your biceps would rise so much more strong, so far more true? Who taught you to shrug casually? Why not? It wasn't me. I know nothing about fashion. I was not born with your beauty or with your optimism. You learned to walk while wearing a red jacket. Your tiny, run, your tiny running shoes were red, green, blue. You could not be dissuaded from the delight you took in the brightest rising of the moon. You refused to eat from the navy blue plates because they were, you tried to say, with a language you had then, a most despairing hue. Go on, live, put it on, stride it out, take color as a sign for what this world is worth, and every flower in each garden as your proof, and don't stay home on Friday nights when the girls inside the river bars are wearing cinnabar, crimson, white silver, and looking so good. And when you stand beside me on the hill above the earth where my father and now my mother lie adjacent in their boxes, when we stand there and above our heads the breeze is the breeze and the bell tower chimes, don't be anyone but you as you tell them loudly the stories of you and the you you are becoming. You are the one they want to hear from. You are the one to whom they'll listen because maybe it's cold down there and goodness warms them, or maybe they've not considered amaranth for a while, or atomic tangerine, or British racing green, and just listening to you through that wood, through the earth, will stipple the thoughts in their dreams. And this is to my father. Dear Dad, writing to you from a rented room Morning of rain, fog, and the clouds blowing north. The near tree is woven with birds, nothing little birds that are not pretty until they fly. Then they confetti the air, they feather white it. There's the window, then a street, then the tree lacing and unlacing its birds, then a river shallow and beached with stone. Christ wouldn't need a miracle to cross it. He'd just start walking, and there he'd be on the other side where the last of the leaves on the bones of those trees have gone from green to cinnamon to sun. Beyond them rises an Appalachian hill, and beyond that I can't see. They say there are moose here, bears, wild cats. They say that the abandoned houses on the forest edge are vaporous. Step inside and you'll vanish. The other night, two dogs bisected the head beams of the car my husband was driving. Wolves, I said, coyotes. That it was dark and it was late. There is no knowing. There will always be less knowing. I made so many mistakes, you said, weeks before death took you. I shook my head no. The last test is forgiveness, and through all my years as your daughter, I refuse to fail, being stubborn as they come, and then some. And besides, sometimes you loved me, said you did, proved it. I am less complicated without you, here in this rented room, watching the fog fool itself into lifting, and the birds making white dots, and Christ leaving his footprints on the minor flow of the story. I am less worrying about the end because the end has come. I am less writing the alternative hoping. You left in the howl of a storm, and it's really something how in this moment, by this window, 
the fog and the clouds and the birds are becoming the same soft thing. It's really something that I am here watching, and you aren't anywhere except within me. You'd like the birds, Dad. You'd like the river. There is so much more I'd urge to show you. And then I'm going to do just one last small piece. This is um, a a one-and-a-half-page letter, last letter to Dard. Dear Dard, on a frontispiece or above a caption, in the pages of one of your books that was made with your own paper, above the crease in a newspaper, in the shine of the Saturday Evening Post, in a book your grandson made, and then I list some of his, the captions. Father diligently at work cleaning bricks from the iron foundry in 1929. These old bricks were used in rebuilding the brick end and chimney of the mill. Or Dard Hunter examines a proof from old paper making. Or Dard Hunter demonstrating the various processes of making paper by hand at MIT. Those are portraits, Dard, you. I lean in close, desperate to see. I activate the emotal with my imagination so that you speak or maybe hum, so that you turn the white carnation in the lapel of your suit jacket with fingers worn from making, so that you regale the boy and his teddy bear who sit by feet, your first son who would grow up with your name and in your image. All those miles, all that hoisting, all that standing patiently in place over type and ink and wet water-marked paper in damp or hot or poorly heated places have not lessened you. Your height is undiminished, but you don't exert it, don't press it to your advantage over others. You like a good suit, a vest, a tie, or you like your shirt sleeves rolled in the Southeast Asian sun, or you tuck your knickers into your tall socks, but you are never underdressed, Dard, not for any photographed occasion. Your bright hair silvers with the years, yet the tidal waves remain you push them back from your broad forehead. There is so much room, Dard, in your face. There is so much here. There is so much, let me show you. There is so much that remains. I didn't know how I was going to end this book um, until, I guess fortunately, the bookshelves in my office collapsed and fell onto boxes and boxes of things, which then required me to go through them. And um, I highly recommend that process. It's a, it's a correction. First of all, now I have nice new shells in there, and it's much neater, and there's less spiderweb opportunity. Um, but in being forced to open boxes that I hadn't really considered opening for a long time, um, I discovered such proof of love in my family that I had somehow managed to neglect knowing. And among the things that I discovered in that box were um, all the ephemera of my wedding to Bill in 1985, June 25th, 1985. And it became clear that my father had, um, he had planned that whole wedding. Everything was in on, his, in, in, on the index cards in his handwriting. And in one index card folded was the remarks he made as the toast for Bill and me. And when I found that, you know, I had taken care of my father for many years, you know, as he aged. And then through COVID, I wasn't able to be with him when he, when uh, Bill and I were there in the last moments of his life, but we were not there for many months preceding it. Um, It is so important to find the young, as you're taking care of the old, the young version, who they were, how did they talk to you, what were they fearing for you. My father would send me beautiful letters that I'd forgotten receiving when they were down south and I was stubbornly here. Um, And so I guess my hope for my life in paper is to send all of you and anyone who chooses to read it back to the ephemera of their lives. To open your heart to what you might find there your vision of who loved you and how they loved you might change, but really your vision of yourself will change. Um, 
I was very deeply changed by the writing of this book, by dwelling with paper doilies and you know, old report cards and what did teachers say to me and who did I become regardless of that and um, you know, resumes, the syllabus, the syllabus, my last full syllabus for Penn. Um, writing books change the writers and if we're lucky they'll change the readers too. And I just want to end by saying um, I write these odd books and Temple University Press has been very kind to publish them. My first very odd book with Temple was The Life and Flow, The Life and Times of Philadelphia's Schuylkill River, um, a book in which the river speaks. Um, my life in paper is an extra degree or two of odd and complex. And um, I sent the first, I think, 40 pages to Sean one day when getting on the train at Penn just before I left. And when I was getting on the train back, checking my email, there was a beautiful note from him saying, I would like to talk to you about this book. And we had, I guess, two or three days later, a really long conversation. And he totally understood what I was trying to do. He didn't try to box it into any um, category, and he didn't question these odd letters to Dard. He also, when I said, hey, what about me designing the cover? I did, I got to, and the marble end papers are mine, and the cyanotypes inside, working with Kate, who is, does a great job designing books there. Um, and so, every book takes its own journey out into the world. This is the book I wanted it to be. There are flaws, there's a typo here and there. I just found one while I was reading. Um, but it is the book that I wanted it to be, and when we think about this literary life, I think in the end that's all you have. You have control over the object itself, and the rest is whatever might become of it. So I'm grateful, Sean, and to Temple University Press for allowing me to create a book that I'm super proud of. And thank you, and I'll take any questions from anyone. Hi. Uh, so I'm... As mentioned, Sean V. Hill, the editor that had the pleasure of working with Beth on this incredible volume. Um, so, you know, leaving aside my own uh, relationship reading many drafts of the book, you know, um, one question I, I suppose uh, that I would ask you simply as a reader, you know, uh, abstracting myself from this process that we took together, the journey we took together, but in reading it now under the, the actual physical cover as the ob tangible object. Uh, such as it is writing a book about paper and ephemera and transmitting that information via computer is a strange thing. So, you know, where I'm going with this essentially is um, sort of how you view this own book as its own ephemeral object and, you know, your, your own conceptualization of maybe the process of what it was going to become as a paper object itself, you know, and that's a vague, large question. That's why I'm here as an editor to ask you vague, large questions, you know, that prompt you in that way. But, you know, one thing that was always in the back of my mind was, you know, this is going to become another entry in some future book, you know, in a way. You know, it's its own <laughs> member of the items in the box, in a way. It's, it's a way that holds all of the ideas yeah. and memories that you catalog within it. It becomes its own vessel, right? Yeah. So. Maybe as you think about where you are now with the project, how you sort of view this as its, its own chapter in, in the book that it is, if that statement makes any sense. <laughs> you know, Sean, when we talked in the very first conversation, you were already envisioning it, not as a paperback, not as you wanted it to be, you know, a real book. And it is a real book. And I'm... Um, Bill and I do craft shows, you know, I, I make paper things, Bill is an illustrator and a ceramicist, and this book travels to all those shows. I, I, it is displayed there as, it, it occupies this space in me, which no other book of mine does and probably never will, where the writing of it and the making of it are conjoined, you know, having the cover having my scissors on it, my, my dictionary page, my fallen cyclamen, my bit of thread at the corner, 
some sort of rough art on the side, the, uh, a, um, a shadow of a cyanotype on the back. It feels like I physically got to make it. So it wasn't, you know, I was standing there with the camera on a rainy day, trying not to shake, taking this photograph. And um, I've never had, this is why the book means so much to me, I, I've never had this feeling that it was both built by hand and built by heart. And um, that's why it matters so much to me. Um, and yet you don't want it to be such a self-indulgent process that it's just this thing you wanted to make because you wanted to make it. And that is why in the introduction I talked about my quest always for the universal. Because the memoiristic pieces, the letters to Dard, and the historical footnotes that accompany this are all designed to make space for the reader. And also, even just the layout of the book itself, rather than the typical, you know, there's white space between paragraphs. I, I think about what are the wedge makers in books? What, what creates that room for the reader? Um, I would have been really disappointed in myself if this book didn't have that. But what's been interesting to me is those who have read it, it's interesting, the writers who have read it who are writing to me are saying, I have been paralyzed and because of this book I'm writing again. I don't know what about the book does that for them, but others are writing to me uh, and, or talking to me and it's not about what I wrote about my mother's sewing patterns. It's about their mother and their sewing pattern or their recipe or whatever their mother had that somehow was carried in paper. Um, I'm not being asked. I, I did an interview with Carolyn Levitt and, um, you know, a Zoom interview, and it was not an interview about Dard Hunter. You should have seen, I spent, I have 14 pages of notes, like all these cheat notes here. Um, I thought she was gonna ask me something very specific about, no. She and we, we decided we would do this just an hour or two before. We spent the time, she was showing me her paper ephemera and I was showing her mine. And that's what I hope this book does for people. It's written in short bursts. And, and also these, I, I'll also say that Dard, he really believed he'd failed. He wanted more than anything to build a, a working, a, a, a paper mill where the paper was handmade. He tried twice, both um, failed in ways, not completely failed. Um, and I felt such tenderness towards him because I think we're in the, in the writing enterprise, we're always trying to hold ourselves back from feeling as if we failed. I don't believe that this book fails. What happens to it when it goes out into the world, that is beyond me. But because you, Sean, gave me such latitude in making this thing, it's what I want it to be. I can't imagine writing it into another book because it is its own whole thing. Um, I wanted to give you a reaction first and then ask you a question. And, um, I have to say I was tearing up during your reading on several occasions, um, partly because my mother sewed all of my clothes, partly because I skated huh. and um, was reminded of skating today when it got so cold and how my toes used to freeze. So there's so much in it that already, I just want you to know that it, it did reach out in the way that you hoped that the book would. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, but, and the question that I have is, why do you think your mother bought that book? It sounds like she hadn't That really was the great mystery. That is what I thought I would be able to find out in writing the book. And so the trajectory of the book changed when I realized I never would now. My mother was interested in, my uncle had been interested in antiques. He was her brother. And when he passed away, she tried to sort of take that mantle on and write her own book. But she as great as she was at so many things. And she could write beautiful sentences, but that, that wasn't her thing. So she was increasingly um, ravenously going around the country collecting things that I think she thought might be in her book, but how she found him, I will never know. It frustrates the heck out of me um, because I would have loved to talk to her about it. I, it took 10 months for me and my father to pack up his house before he moved to Waverly Heights. 10 months 
I thought I'd touched everything in that house. In this book, my father had a few boxes that he wouldn't allow me to see. And somehow this book was in that collection of private secret things. So I never got to talk to him about it. And my brother is um, someone who, you know, will have us for Thanksgiving. I always give Christmas gifts to them on Thanksgiving, and he'll realize about an hour before, oh, I don't have something, or something like that goes on in his mind. So he grabbed this book from the shelf because it was about paper, and I was already making these paper things. And he gave it to me, and he had no idea what he began with. Um, because researching Dard was quite the story, and his grandson, Dard Hunter III, as I referenced, lives in Dard. Dard Hunter's house, Mountain House in Chillicothe, Ohio. Um, and Bill and I traveled. We had wonderful conversations. We, you know, I read everything. I spent a lot of time in Kislak. As much as I researched him and as much as I thought about my mother, I could never find the place where the two connected. And so I really didn't know Sean does not know that I started having anxiety attacks, like, wait, this was supposed to be the governing issue here, but I don't have an answer. And then the almost God speed or something, the, the, the shelves crashed. And while the answer to why did my mother have this book was not there, the answer to them was. And that became... Um, I think really the last pages of the book are, which I didn't read, are, um, are everything I think we all feel about melancholy and regret, you know, um, about not knowing enough then when they were still alive. So I don't know. My brother has all these boxes and he is always teasing me with some artifact that he's just found and I always say, is there a note from mom about Dart Hunter? And he hasn't found it. So should we say good night on a cold night? Thank you very much. And thank you, Laura. Thank you.